Sarah Petal, the Dean at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. And it is my pleasure to welcome Simon Linglock, one of our senior lecturers, who will be sharing his views with us on sovereign debt. Simon, do you think COVID-19 looks more like a shock event or a shift event now? And what are the implications of that? OK, well, it's, it, it's a good question because obviously, you know, when we talk about shock events, we're talking about things which are relatively short term and then getting back to a kind of normal situation. Um, whereas when we talk about shift events, we're really talking about things which are going to go on for a longer period of time. And, you know, whether you're kind of thinking about companies or governments, it, it's a big difference between, you know, are we looking to um, deal with something for two or three months or are we dealing with something that could be going on for two or five years? And the implications in terms of, you know, sort of revenue and, and costs are very, very significant. Now, I think, you know, as kind of things been sort of developing, um, it's looking much more like a shift event. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, we've already had uh, coming on for eight weeks of uh, kind of lockdown in, in the UK with, with furloughing. Um, and just today, uh, we've had uh, the Chancellor announce that the furlough scheme is going to be extended to October. So clearly, it, it's not going away very, very quickly. Um, you know, sort of, there was a, a report done by the uh, Resolution Fund um, just a few weeks back where they said that uh, they thought that if the lockdown was for about um, six months, a recovery phase could take two to five years. So we're definitely looking at a shift event. Uh, we look at other countries around the world, you know, we're seeing similar kind of things. In, in America, uh, 33 million have uh, signed up for unemployment benefit in just the last seven weeks. So, you know, there's a kind of significant changes going on. And of course, this has um, implications both in terms of uh, expenditure of governments and, of course, in terms of tax re receipts. So we, we're going to see some major shifts here. As you mentioned, governments have been incurring huge costs. The NHS, furloughing staff, unemployment benefit schemes, offering guarantee schemes to corporate borrowings during the lockdown falling revenue from taxes. Do you think this extra burden of debt will be sustainable? Well, that's a good question. And of course, it, it will um, vary country to country. Um, you know, so I was looking at uh, recent um, statistics that came out from, from the IMF uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, you know, your kind of comments about these kind of expenditures, and of course, it's uh, different between country to country as to what, what they're doing. Um, but they're kind of estimating this could add up to about uh, to, um, 2.6 trillion pounds um, for all of these different kind of schemes across the world. Um, and which in aggregate could add 13 percent to um, the debt um, of, to, to, to gross domestic products of, of the world, um, taking up to over 96 percent of, of GDP. So that's a massive increase in, in a relatively short space of time. And of course, you know, if this kind of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, lockdown and, and then sort of uh, slow recovery extends on beyond a longer period of time than expected, you know, we could see um, even deeper cuts. Um, you know, we can also see um, in, in other areas, you know, the kind of Bank of England um, in their kind of uh, report just a few days ago, um, talked about potential um, credit losses that uh, banks are going to be facing in the UK. And uh, to just remind myself of the figure, um, they're talking about that being about 80 billion just for the UK, uh, which is, you know, a, a huge number. Um, they reckon that will account for about 45 percent of the capital buffers. Um, the banks have. So it's obviously going to kind of drag down their kind of capital ratios. But because banks are so much stronger than, you know, like 12 years ago, and their capital um, basis CT1 is about three times stronger than it was back in 2008, uh, means banks can, can withstand that. But nevertheless, those kind of losses um, is going to mean that uh, kind of, I would think, um, you know, type of lending criteria is going to become stricter going forward, um, and they're going to be kind of less willing to lend. And so, you know, type of the kind of the motor recovery in terms of, of credit is going to be slower. 
So all of these kind of things um, kind of indicate that uh, economic growth is going to be slow. It's going to have an impact on on uh, sort of uh, government debts and how quickly they're building up. So basically, you know, what kind of deficit levels uh, governments are running each year. And of course, this year they're, they're kind of ballooning. Uh, but will they continue to balloon in future years? And of course, if they do, um, you know, continue to, to balloon at much higher levels than perhaps, you know, the three, four percent um, that we've seen for many governments in recent years, um, then that debt is going to kind of continue to to increase. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the question is, is um, sort of uh, the correlation between um, overall external debt and uh, potential of default? Now, this is not an easy one to answer, actually, because if we look at different countries, they kind of look very, very different. Um, you know, sort of the UK uh, this year, if its um, debt goes up 10, 11 percent, we're heading towards 96 percent. Um, and we've been at these levels much higher before. Um, Italy is expected to go up at least 20 percent to 155 percent, which, you know, it seems quite high. Um, Germany, on, on the other hand, um, is only going to go up perhaps 9% to 69%, so still very, very comfortable levels. Um, whereas if you compare that to somewhere like Greece, uh, 2010, their um, kind of uh, debt levels were standing around 146%. Um, since their um, financial crisis, um, you know, it's been sitting around 170, 180%, even after, uh, you know, sort of all of the... Um, uh, to up haircuts and, and actions have been taken in that country. And that reflects the shrinkage in GDP. So, you know, there's, there's two factors is of the sustainability is kind of, you know, what is happening with, with, with GDP um, and, and therefore is it uh, sustainable? If we actually look in, in, in the UK, for instance, um, our debt has been much, much higher. If you went back to the um, just after the Napoleonic Wars, it was standing around 260%. If you looked just after the first, uh, the Second World War, you're standing around 250 percent. Um, generally, on average, if you looked at um, kind of the country's uh, debt to, to GDP since it's first um, calculated back in the late 17th century, it's, it's averaged around 100 percent. So nothing too different to where, where we're standing today. Um, America, for instance, uh, at the end of the Second World War, its uh, debt to uh, GDP was standing around 150 percent. So when you look at that, you know, some of these kind of, um, you know, top markets, even Italy, you know, top is, is not out of the ballpark at all. I think one of the key issues is is what happens in the future. So if you look at, uh, you know, top, uh, Britain after the Napoleonic Wars, we had the Industrial Revolution, we had fast growth. It took uh, debt down very, very quickly. Um, after the Second World War, um, there was a lot of recovery uh, spending and, you know, economies uh, in the West grew very quickly. And of course, it made it sustainable. You compare that to a country like Greece, you know, they've had high levels of debt, but they don't have um, anything to really kickstart um, their, their economy to make their GDP grow quickly. So I think, you know, one of the key things we're looking at for countries is this stuff, you know, how their GDP is likely to grow in the future to see that sustainable level. But the other factor is actually the willingness of governments um, and effectively the population to um, withstand pain in a way. So, you know, we've seen countries have defaulted um, with much lower uh, uh, debt to GDP levels. Um, so it, it's very difficult to kind of like put a figure and say above this level it's unsustainable, below it, it it is sustainable, because it depends on the kind of willingness of people to finance a high debt level. You know, look at Japan, for instance, you know, that has a very, very high uh, debt to GDP level. Um, but then it's a lot of it is financed domestically. So they have a kind of willing support there. Um, for those countries who do not have that access and have to rely more on foreign um, kind of uh, uh, investors, it is more problematic for them. And that's why it was more problematic for Greece, actually. Uh, so there's, there's no kind of easy answer to say, you know, sort of high, high GDP debt levels will lead to default. Um, that, you know, it certainly looks like uh, sort of more and more countries um, over the medium term, we're going to have to say, how are we going to deal with these higher debt levels? How are we going to reduce them? And, 
simply it's pain. You know, it's pain in terms of higher taxation. It's it's pain in terms of how um, services are cut back to kind of, if you like, fit your cloth to to uh, what you're earning. Um, and I think, you know, sort of for countries who may think about defaulting, um, one of the issues they have to consider is what they save in terms of financing costs, i.e. not paying the interest and uh, the debt repayments on their foreign debt, to the need to then actually balance um, the, the, their kind of annual government deficit because, uh, you know, not effectively not having a deficit. Because if they um, start default, they effectively close themselves off from foreign markets and therefore have no ability to finance deficits apart from printing money. And of course, we know if you start printing money in volumes uh, before you know it, uh, inflation takes off and you've got an even bigger problem. Looking further afield, what impact might we see on emerging countries around the world affected by COVID-19? Yeah, um, so, you know, this is obviously, you know, not just a, a, a Western issue. Um, you know, we've obviously got to see kind of how badly it impacts uh, different countries. Um, you know, sort of, you know, again, you know, if, if some of these emerging markets go in, into lockdown, um, obviously some of those emerging markets are, are quite large in, in themselves. Um, so there is obviously issues there of potentially how is that going to be funded when a lot of these emerging markets actually have very high debt levels to start with. Um, I think another potential um, issue is this type of what they then do, um, you know, because they're not only going to be impacted by COVID, um, you know, some of these economies are obviously being impacted because of very low commodity prices. And if we get back to that first point you made of, of you know, is it a shock or is it a shift? Um, if we're talking about a shift situation and um, economies not recovering quickly, then I don't see commodity prices recovering particularly quickly either. So basically the income side um, of some of these emerging markets, which are heavily reliant on commodities, is going to be heavily affected. Now the question, I suppose, is from there is, um, you know, what do they what do they do with with their economies? Do they start to go to these kind of protectionist measures? Um, and we're seeing that in in South America now. We think about the Mercosur bloc. Um, you know, Argentina is almost on its ninth um, uh, sovereign default, possibly. Um, you know, it's kind of hinging there at that, at the moment, um, and they've already kind of um, raised issues about the Mercosur block and what they're going to do there. Um, and of course, if you start to um, end up with um, kind of trade being affected by everyone trying to protect their own um, economies, you potentially could actually get back to a situation we saw in the 1930s, um, where protectionism um, led to a massive reduction in world trade. And that would be a disaster for everyone. Um, so there's, there's not easy answers to any of these things. You know, there's lots of um, black clouds out, out there. And I think a lot of it will be dependent on, you know, sort of what governments do. Um, but also, um, you know, what bodies like the World Bank and the IMF does and how much room they are given um, when you've got, uh, you know, people like um, Trump in the presidency in America, who's very much, you know, looking after America first. Um, and potentially kind of not giving, you know, the kind of resources that those bodies may well need, which are going to be potentially far wider um, than, you know, that's ever been there in the past. You've definitely given us a lot of food for thought, Simon. Um, thank you so much for sharing your views on sovereign debt with us today. Goodbye, everyone. Keep safe. Keep well. Mm -hmm.